Desperately waiting for visas for Senator loved ones. Wong, your time has retired. Uh, we will move up. Minister, are you seeking the call before question time? Not before question time. We'll move to questions on notice. Minister. Uh, Mr President, I do seek leave to make a statement regarding a ministerial absence. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, I advise the Senate that Senator Birmingham will be absent from question time today, Tuesday, the 29th of March 2022, for budget arrangements. In Senator Birmingham's absence, I will represent the Prime Minister, the Minister for Finance, the Minister assisting the Prime Minister and Cabinet, the Minister for the Public Service, the Treasurer, the Assistant Treasurer, and the Special Minister for State. Thank you. We will now move to question time. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne, and I refer to the reports that Solomon Islands Prime Minister Mr Sagavare has told his parliament a security agreement between the Solomon Islands and China has been finalised and, quote, the document is ready for signing, end quote. When did the Australian government first become aware that China and Solomon Islands were negotiating a security agreement and what action did the Australian government take in response? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank uh, Senator Wong for her question. We have been aware of increasing engagement, uh, in increasing interest in engagement with China in the Solomon Islands for some time, uh, and we have absolutely and consistently demonstrated that Australia uh, is always ready to support the Solomon Islands, together with uh, members of the Pacific family, particularly in our work together. The most recent demonstration of that uh, is the strength of the response of Australia, New Zealand, the Pacific, um, Papua New Guinea uh, and uh, Fijian representatives of part of the Solomon Islands Assistance Force uh, in November of last year, Mr President, which deployed more than 200 members of the AFP, the Defence Force uh, and DFAT personnel to assist in the restoration of law and order. Uh, about 50 members of the ADF, the AFP and DFAT remain deployed uh, in those tasks in the Solomon Islands. Um, on 24th of March, the Solomon Islands Prime Minister uh, also announced that uh, we will be extending our bilateral security treaty assistance to support the Solomon Islands to prepare and assist for the Pacific Games, uh, which are in December of 2023, that we'll construct a second patrol boat outpost on Solomon Islands' eastern border which is in addition to the western border and patrol boat outpost in the Shortland Islands. Uh, we'll also build an integrated police, health and disaster management radio network across the Solomon Islands. These are matters which have been under discussion uh, for a period of time, particularly the latter, uh, Mr President, the radio network, with uh, Solomon Islands officials. Um, for example, Minister Andrews and I participated in a bilateral security meeting uh, with uh, Foreign Minister Manelli and the Police Minister uh, some months ago now, Mr President, in its regular rotation, I should say, uh, as part of, uh, of that process. Uh, and I would also say to the Chamber Minister, that we've been clear— Minister, your time has expired. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Article 1 of the reported draft framework agreement states, and I quote, the relevant forces of China can be used to protect the safety of Chinese personnel and major projects in Solomon Islands. What does the minister and the government understand Article 1 of the reported draft agreement to mean? Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr President. And uh, a note in respect of the articles themselves, they're obviously not uh, matters to which the Australian government is a party in the preparation of or the uh, uh, or the progression of, and we've been clear and regularly and respectfully raised our concerns with the Solomon Islands government about uh, these matters of security engagement. Uh, and it is particularly concerning to us that there may be associated with this any actions that undermine the stability and the security of our region, uh, which I have said previously and repeated in public comments uh, in recent days. We believe that the Pacific family, in its broad, is best placed to provide security assistance to the Solomon Islands, and we stand ready to assist further if that is needed. We have been explicitly uh, and emphatically clear in relation to that, and in fact not just in words, Mr President, because that is what our deeds demonstrate uh, in all of our actions in relation Minister, to engagement on these matters Minister, with the Solomon Islands. Your time has expired. Senator Wong, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the Minister confirm 
that Australian bilateral official development assistance to Solomon Islands has been cut by $41.8 million, or 21 per cent, since Budget 2018-19. Minister. Thank you, Order. Mr. President. And Senator Seselja uh, is right, but that is a misrepresentation. Order. It does not incorporate the. It does not incorporate uh, consideration of Australia's uh, construction of the Coral Sea Cable from Order. Honiara uh, to land. Sydney, and also, of course, to Port Moresby. What the senator also completely ignores. Order. So, Mr. President. Order. Minister, Mr. President, Minister, I would say Minister, that resume your seat. Order in the chamber. Interjections are always disorderly. Please, let's hear the minister speak. Minister, you have the call. Mr. President, I would say it is unlikely that some of the interjections from the other side that I can hear are audible more broadly, and particularly on the broadcast. But I would say, Mr. President, that those opposite have indicated in recent weeks their strong commitment to bipartisanship in matters of foreign policy. I fail to see that demonstrated here today. Here. Here. Senator, order, order, Senator Davey. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience, Senator McKenzie. Um, can the Minister please update the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals government is supporting New South Wales and Queensland communities who have been affected by the recent devastating and ongoing flood emergencies? Order, Watt. Thank you, Senator Watt. I'd like to hear from the Minister rather than you. Order. Order. The Minister for Emergency Management, Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Davey, for the question. Firstly, I want to extend mine and the government's, and I'm sure this chamber's, sincere condolences to the families and loved ones of the now 24 people who have lost their lives to the terrible flooding event uh, that has started in Queensland on the 22nd of February and has spread throughout the East Coast to encompass over 81 local government areas in Queensland and New South Wales. I want to also thank our amazing SES, RFS, uh, our emergency service volunteers, our ADF and all those wonderful Australians who have done what we are best known for, helping out our neighbours, our communities, when times are tough. And this isn't over. Uh, just today, the rains are continuing to fall, and right now we have six evacuation orders uh, in these already traumatised communities. We will continue to work uh, closely with both New South Wales and Queensland to ensure uh, that support is available to those communities in need. And I just want to pay tribute to both uh, my state Labor colleague in Queensland and my state Nationals colleague in New South Wales for working so collaboratively uh, during this period. Having visited Lismore, Gympie, Ballina, Brisbane, other uh, communities, as the former Governor-General said, uh, Cosgrove when he was on the ground in Lismore. It is like ground zero. This recovery effort isn't going to be a sprint, it's going to be a marathon, and our government has delivered the fastest rollout of both financial and non-financial assistance to these communities we've ever seen following a major disaster oh. event. And it is at a scale, this is likely to surpass uh, our response to the Black Summer bushfires. In anticipation, we activated Comms Displan on the 25th of February, and it remains active. Queensland made its first uh, request on the 26th of February and on later that week we also had requests in for category A and B assistance uh, from New South Wales. And since then we've been able to support over 1.4 million Australians uh, in combination yeah. with our state Minister, government colleagues to Minister, get through this disaster. Your time has expired. A supplementary question, Senator Davey. Thank you, Minister. Uh, we've heard a lot about the Emergency Response Fund, which um, is available. Can you please explain how our government intends to use that fund to support Australians affected by these floods? Minister. Thank you. The Emergency Response Fund, a future fund, was designed to grow over the next decade to $6.6 billion. It's there for when Order. all other avenues of funding have been exhausted, and its primary purpose is to ensure that we're prepared for the future events, for future generations. And the legislation underpinning that fund is incredibly prescriptive about how it is used. 
The magnitude of the floods in this event and the extent of the damage that they've caused is exactly the type of scenario that the ERF was designed to deal with. And that is why we will draw down on the fund and use the $150 million allowed for this financial year to uh, fund emergency response and recovery, with $75 million going to both the Queensland State Government and the New South Wales well, State Government. And we'll use $150 million for the 22-23 recovery Order. specifically for Lismore after the catastrophic flood event there, to, for them to be able to use it for flood mitigation uh, following a study that the government will also Minister. fund. Senator Davey, a second supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, what other resilience measures has the government put in place to reduce the impact of future natural disasters? Minister. As the first Australian government to establish a national resilience-focused agency, I can absolutely confirm we are committed to building Australia's resilience to natural disasters. Our plan is more considered than simply rebranding a fund that already exists, as Labor is doing with its Disaster Ready Fund, under which it claims it will spend up to $200 million, not a ringing endorsement for a funding program. Unlike Labor, we're actually getting on with the job of building resilience, of giving communities hope for the future and support in the present, not politicising vulnerable communities who are struggling right now, uh, whether it be bushfire traumatised communities or current flooded communities, in their efforts to get back on their seat, feet. Our $600 million Preparing Australia program will support communities to undertake disaster risk reduction and resilience initiatives to reduce the impact of future disasters, because we know here in this country this will not be the last flood. This will not be the last Minister, bushfire or cyclone yeah, yeah. that our Minister, people will have to deal with. Your time with. has expired. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience, Senator McKenzie. New South Wales Liberal Catherine Cusack, MLC, has described Mr Morrison's politicisation of flood relief as, and I quote, probably the most unethical approach I have Order. ever seen. She has said she will resign, and I quote, she says, I can't defend it, and I am outraged by it. How can the Morrison government defend its own approach when even New South Wales state Liberals won't defend it? The Minister order, order, Senator Watt, order, 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 Senator Watt. Senator Watt, Senator Patterson and Senator Reynolds, you're not assisting. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Well, the rainfall Order. and subsequent flooding event that occurred in late February and early March and continues even today has caused devastation throughout these communities, particularly northern New South Wales and the seven local Order. government areas of the Northern Rivers. And unlike many of those opposite who are choosing to yell and scream about this devastating impact which has caused Australians to lose their lives, rather than actually Order. hear about the, the things that, as a federal government, we've done in, in conjunction with the state government to actually support these communities. So right now, at the peak Order. of Operation Flood Assist 22, there were 7,000 ADF personnel present across Queensland Senator and Watt. New South Wales. Right now, there's around 4,000 ADF Watt. in Lismore itself, and they're assisting that community with the very tough task of getting the piles of rubbish that I know you've seen, Senator Watt, on the streets of Lismore, off the streets, of heading out into smaller communities of Wardell, Korokai, Broadwater and beyond to actually assist with the very long task of the clean-up. And they're, they've Senator been welcomed Keneally. with open arms in these communities. Open arms. And I know it was quite Minister, um, hard for Minister, the ADF. Minister, on a point of order. Uh, the point of order is relevance. The question went to the comments by Ms Cusack and, uh, in particular, her comments regarding the ethics of the Morrison government's approach to flood relief. The minister hasn't gone to that question at all. I have been listening carefully to the minister's answer. I cannot instruct the minister on how to answer a question. I believe she was being directly relevant to the question. Minister, you have 43 seconds. Uh, thank order, you. Thank you Watt. very much, Mr President. Well, as um, 
We know disaster recovery funding arrangements that were set up in 2018 are jointly funded by Commonwealth Order, and State Kinder. governments. And at the very day that these flooding events were occurring Senator in New McAllister. South Wales, these were activated by the New South Wales government, as is the appropriate governance arrangements for the disaster recovery funding arrangements. And in that first uh, days of the flood event, we were rolling out temporary accommodation assistance with the New South Wales government. We were funding it. They are responsible for rolling it out. Uh, we were also assisting them Order. with local council grants and the like for that immediate Minister. response. Now Minister. we've shifted Minister. to recovery. Your time has expired. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. New South Wales Nationals MP Jeff Provost has said, and I quote, the federal government have really messed this up. Mm -hmm. This is like a remake of the bushfires some two years ago. Yep. How can the Morrison government defend its own approach when even New South Wales nationals won't defend it? That's right. He's... Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Well, as I said uh, in my previous answer, we have been able to get, at a Commonwealth level, both non-financial, being the ADF boots Order, on the ground, the Taipan helicopters Senator rescuing people off roofs in Lismore itself within Senator hours Keneally. because we did pre-posture ahead of that request from the New South Wales government. Uh, and we have, uh, even now, 4,000 ADF on the ground, so non-financial support in record time and financial support in record time, rolled out through Services Australia Order, and our Senator own Keneally. disaster payment and disaster recovery allowance. Now, it might not suit the Labor Party's narrative, who wants to uh, you know, politicise natural disasters, but what Australians in need want to Senator hear Wong, from their leaders, what Australians in need want to hear from their political leaders, irrespective Senator of whether they're federal or state, irrespective of whether they're Labor or Liberal, is actually working together Minister, to get the response Minister, where it's needed, when it's Minister. needed. It is, it is becoming increasingly difficult to hear the Minister's answers. Senator McAllister, a second supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. Well, Mr Provost also declared that he was disgusted by Mr Morrison, yep. and I quote him again, he said, I would struggle to vote for him. Yeah. When even members of the New South Wales Liberals and Nationals can't defend Mr Morrison, can't stomach voting for him and are disgusted with him, does the minister really expect Australians to feel differently? Yeah, yeah. Minister. As I was saying, Australians in need are quite offended by those in the privileged positions that we hold for cheap political Order. point scoring. They want us to get on Order with the job on of assisting them in their time of need. And whether it is uh, that immediate response phase in the immediate days when people are actually, thousands of people are homeless here, getting temporary accommodation sorted, making sure they've got cash in their accounts uh, to purchase petrol, purchase clothes. That's exactly what the Palaszczuk Government Order. partnered with us to do, as did the Perrottet state Keneally. government do Senator with the Commonwealth. And once Senator we move McAllister. into the recovery phase, which we are now in, and this is going to last Senator a Watt. long time, we are rolling out additional measures depending on what the state governments decide. So Palaszczuk government wanted to give in their category D response twenty thousand dollars to community groups. The Perrottet government chose to Minister, your time has expired. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Hume, representing the Minister for the Environment. Senator Hume, could you please update the Chamber uh, on the Minister Susan Lay's uh, comments uh, or her updates on the devastating and very concerning news that the Great Barrier Reef is experiencing its fourth mass coral bleaching? in the last six years. The Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Hume. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Wish Wilson for his question. Mr President, the Commonwealth, the Commonwealth Government, the Morrison Government, is deeply committed to protecting the World Heritage listed Great Barrier Reef. One sentence in. The tourism industry, traditional owners, reef communities, they rely on the Morrison Government's commitment to the reef, and we will not let them down. 
Before COVID closed the world's borders, economic activity stemming from the reef was worth an estimated $6.4 billion annually and 64,000 jobs. Mr President, the Morrison government's enduring commitment to the protection of the reef was demonstrated just last Friday with the announcement of an additional $1 billion in new funding. Now, this additional funding takes the total funding by the Australian and Queensland governments to more than $4 billion by 2030. More than $3 billion of this is from the Australian government. Benchmarked against global standards, Australia's Senator management Pratt. of the reef is recognised as a leading example and is considered Minister, by many— Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Wish Wilson on a point of order. Point of order on relevance, President. Um, I asked a very quick question. I asked the minister to update us on Minister Lay's comments regarding the devastating news from last week. Um, we don't need talking points. Senator, I'd actually Senator like Wish her to address Wilson. my question. I've heard your point of order. Um, I've been listening to the minister's answer. The minister was being directly relevant to the question. The min I cannot direct a minister how to answer a question. The minister was being relevant to the question. I've been listening. Minister, you have the call. You have just over a minute remaining. Thank you, Mr. President. So, benchmarked against global standards, Australia's management of the reef is recognised as a leading example and is considered by many to be the gold standard for large scale marine protected area management, according to the UNESCO report. This $1 billion package will enhance Australia's world leading management of the reef in four separate ways. Minister, resume your seat. <laughs> Senator McKim. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, Senator McKim. It's been a while. It has been a while. I was just waiting, waiting for the call, uh, President. Um, the point of order is uh, on the same matter that Senator Wish Wilson raised a point of order. That is relevance. The question specifically and only related to the current mass bleaching event on the Great Barrier Reef. The minister has not mentioned the mass bleaching event uh, two thirds of the way through the time allocated for the answer. I simply ask you, President, if you would remind the minister of the question, please. You have had a chance to remind the minister of the question. I've been listening to the minister's answer. The minister was being relevant to the question. Minister, you have the call. 40 seconds remaining. Thank you, Mr President. I'm happy to mention mass bleaching. Now it is mentioned, because mass bleaching is one issue that affects the Great Barrier Reef. Other issues that affect the Great Barrier Reef are changes in climate. Other issues that affect the Great Barrier Reef are crown of thorns starfish. And this additional $1 billion investment that takes the Commonwealth's funding up to $3 billion is just one of the ways that we can address all of the issues that are facing the Great Barrier Reef, for which we are known as the gold standard in response to large-scale marine protected area management, according to UNESCO itself. So there are four ways— Minister. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Wish Wilson, a supplementary question. My well, supplementary question is to ask the same question a different way, so perhaps the minister can respond this time. What has the federal environment minister said about the fourth mass coral bleaching in the last six years on the Great Barrier Reef? Order. Minister, you have the call. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Wish Wilson for saying it louder because I didn't hear it properly the first time quite clearly. So I will happily say that this additional $1 billion package that will enhance Australia's world leading management of the reef will do so in four ways. First and foremost, it will accelerate progress towards water quality targets. Mr. President, we're extending efforts to improve reef Order. water quality and meet our agreed targets Minister. under. Senator Wish Wilson, on a point of order. On a point of order and on relevance. Mr. President, this is an international crisis, and the minister is refusing no. to Senator answer Wish the question. Wilson. It is a Senator disgrace. Wish Wilson, this it is, is a not bloody disgrace. Senator Wish Wilson, resume your seat. This is not a debating time. There is no point of order. Minister. Senator Wish Wilson, I am not where what people are asking you to withdraw, and I do not wish you to repeat it. However, if you said something that you should withdraw, please withdraw it. Senator Wish Wilson, I will review the transcript uh, following, uh, following question time. Minister, you have the call. Thank you, Mr. President. So, 
This new $1 billion investment, which is in addition to the already existing $4 billion investment between the Commonwealth and the Queensland governments, will accelerate progress towards water quality targets. It will, in addition to that, continue our world-leading reef management conservation partnerships. Minister, resume your seat. Senator Wish Wilson. Question. What has the Environment Minister said Senator about the mass Wish coral Wilson. bleaching? What this has she is said? not a debating time. Senator Wish Wilson, as I have said already on a number of occasions today, I cannot direct the minister how to answer a question. You have brought the minister back to a particular um, to, to the question that you asked. However, I have been listening to the minister's answer and I believe she was relevant to the question. Minister, you have the call. You have 21 seconds remaining. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. The third thing that that money will do is support climate adaptation, science, research, and development. And the fourth, oh, Minister, this is getting, this, Minister, this is Minister, resume your seat, Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. On, on a point of order, and the point of order is direct relevance. I simply ask you, please, and uh, later or now, as you wish, Mr. President, but uh, to rule on whether a question that is seeking specifically a response as to what the minister said about an issue can be responded to in a relevant way by simply talking about the issue. Um, that is the matter that I think would assist the Senate if you could uh, rule on that. I'd be very happy for you to take it away and, and, and come I'm back uh, at, at, your, uh, at your leisure, President, but I do think that's an important matter to have clarified for the I Senate. I will come back to the chamber tomorrow with a fulsome explanation. However, I believe that the minister is being directly relevant to the question in answering the way she has. I will explain my position tomorrow. And, Minister, you have the call for 14 seconds. Thank you, Mr President. And finally, the fourth element of that funding will to fund on-the-ground community and traditional owner-led projects. Now, I understand that Labor and the Greens tend to seek to politicise the reef, Order. but the Coalition will continue its long legacy minister, of protecting it. Minister. Your time has expired. A second supplementary, Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, President. Uh, two UNESCO scientists have been in Australia in the last week visiting the Barrier Reef at this government's invitation uh, to assess whether climate change is impacting the world heritage values of the Great Barrier Reef and its UNESCO listing. Can you confirm that those scientists visited reefs that have bleached? And if so, which reefs did they visit? Minister. Thank you, Mr President. I can confirm that scientists were here associating with the Reef Authority and Reef Authority staff have been working with those research partners from the Australian Institute of Marine Science to conduct aerial surveys across the reef. Those surveys concluded on Wednesday the 23rd of March, but the results are still being analysed. The minister is aware that these surveys have detected widespread coral bleaching over a large area of the reef. And these surveys indicate variable minister, levels of bleaching between minister. different regions. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Wish Wilson, on a point of order. On a point of order on relevance, Minister, oh. uh, President. No, no I'm, I'm happy to rule straight away. The, the minister was being directly relevant, Senator Wish Wilson. Well, that she could not have been more relevant. These Senator Wish Wilson. No, these Senator surveys Wilson. have nothing to do Senator with the Wish UNESCO Wilson. visit. Points of order have are nothing not to do an with the UNESCO. To debate. Well, having a minister Senator who actually Wish knows Wilson, what she's talking your about. Seat. Senator Wish Wilson. Question time is not a debating forum. Senator Wish Wilson, there was no point of order. Minister, you have. Mi Senator Wish Wilson. Minister, you have the call. You have 35 seconds remaining. Thank you, Mr. President. So these surveys indicated variable levels of bleaching between different regions and between different reefs. Some reefs are unaffected, others experiencing minor paling, and some where the heat stress is greatest are severely impacted. That is correct. It's important to note that corals can, in fact, survive bleaching events, and some corals will be mildly or moderately Order. affected, and some will recover when favourable conditions return. The Senator bleaching Wish follows Wilson. a summer of very hot weather, following record-breaking temperatures Senator across the reef. But the Reef Authority will continue to brief the minister on reef conditions as the data becomes increasingly available. All right, uh, Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Colbeck, representing the Minister for Health, and it relates to the cost of health care in Australia. 
Minister, when the Medical Costs Finder website was launched two years ago, it was found that patients in some states were paying out-of-pocket costs up to 40 times more than patients in other states for some procedures. Fee transparency was supposed to alleviate this problem. Minister, can you tell me whether the Medical Costs Finder website has helped a single patient by reducing their out-of-pocket costs? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr President. Thank Senator Griff for the question and some notice of the general topic of the question. Mr President, the government continues to invest in Australia's world-leading health system to ensure that Australians do have access to high-quality health services at reasonable cost. The current situation with respect to uh, bulk billing, for example, sees the bulk billing rate at a record high of 83.5 per cent, which is 6.5 per cent higher than when we came to government in 2013. And GP billing, bulk billing records remain at record highs over the 2021 calendar year. The current, um, over that 21 calendar year, the bulk billing rate was 88.7 per cent, 6.9 per cent higher than in 2012, Mr President. Uh, Senator Griff is correct. The purpose of the um, Medical Cost Web Finder site was to provide some uh, visibility and transparency to support Australians to understand what their medical costs might be so that they could make appropriate decisions with respect to where they might access those costs. Um, I don't have with me any specific data in relation to uh, the outcomes of those, um, those elements from the initial build, uh, not noting that the Medical Cost Finder website is still in its initial stages of being developed and there are further stages to be uh, considered. And I uh, understand that uh, Minister Hunt has indicated a willingness to work with you, as we have done on, uh, on other previous sites that have provided visibility, to continue to improve uh, that information made, to be made available uh, to Australians across the board. Uh, but what we continue to do, Mr President, is to invest into Australia's world-leading health system and whether that's Minister, into the MBS system Minister, for... your time has expired. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. Uh, Minister, you haven't actually answered my question. I would have thought that you would have been able to say that at least a single patient might have benefited in some way. Can you actually tell me whether there has actually been a reduction in how much individuals spend overall on health care over this term of government? Minister. Uh, thanks, Mr President. I actually don't have any data on individual spends, at the, um, but uh, I, I do have uh, information as I was just going through about the uh, amount of funding that the government continues to put into the Australia's world-leading health system to support um, Australians to access at reasonable cost uh, their care. So if you look at, for example, Australian government's uh, funding to public hospitals, that's grown from $13.3 billion in 2012-13 to $25.5 billion in uh, 2021. Mr President, by 90 per cent over that period of time. Uh, Minister, we can Minister, resume your seat. Senator Griff, on a point of order. Uh, rele relevance, Mr President. My question was not how much government spends on health care, but how much um, individuals spend on health care and whether there has been a reduction in how much they spend as a result of uh, this particular site? This, the minister did respond to, to, to that question. However, I, I will remind in, when questions are narrowly framed, it is important to remain within the bounds of the question. Uh, minister, you have the call. If you have anything you wish to add for 20 seconds. Thank you, Mr President. Um, I, I did addre specifically address uh, that point, and, and I did indicate that I didn't have any specific data, um, and so uh, on that with me, Mr. President. Uh, but, I, but what I did Senator do, Mr. Lambie. President, was indicate the continued expansion of funding into the health system to Australians to ensure Minister. that they can access Minister. a high-quality health system. Your time has expired. Senator Griff, for second supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Minister, Australia has been reported as having the third highest reliance on individual health care contributions in the world. That's massive. What will government do if re-elected 
to lower the cost for individual Australians, not government costs, but the actual cost to patients, to the public. Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and, and I don't accept the premise of the question because government spending, government spending on health actually does contribute to the cost that would otherwise be the case for Australians with respect to the health, school, health system. That's why, Mr. President, Senator that's Pratt. why we continue to invest in world-leading drugs through the MBS to make sure that Australians can access them at Senator cheaper prices. Pratt. That's why we do that, Mr. President. And we continue to list drugs, take older ones off, put new ones on, so Australians have access to the best possible drugs at, at a reduced price so that they don't have to pay so much for their health system. That's why we continue to, help, to invest so heavily in the public health system. So if they don't have it, can't have access to private health uh, services, they can access it publicly through the public health system, Mr. President. That's why we continue to invest. And Mr. President, that's why the Australian government's investment in the public health system is so important and it does actually contribute to lowering costs to Australians in, in, in accessing Australia's world health best sy health system. Senator Sheldon. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cash. Today, residents of South East Queensland and northern New South Wales face more flooding, with evacuation orders issued in a number of northern rivers towns. Residents are still cleaning up from last month's devastating floods, in which they were abandoned by this Prime Minister. What will Mr Morrison do to make these floods victims are not abandoned by his government yet again? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Sheldon for the question. And uh, in relation to the question, Senator Sheldon, I completely reject what you have just said. This Order. government has not forgotten the people in the floods. In fact, what I would say is that the floods that occurred in late February and early March, they have caused devastation throughout New South Wales or northern New South Wales and the southern Queensland area on a scale that has not been seen, as we all know, since 2011. And in response to that, the Australian government is providing over $2.5 billion, Mr President, over $2.5 billion Order in financial Senator support in response to this devastating flood. And, Mr President, just to ensure Senator Sheldon does understand that the Australian government is working with both the New South Wales and the Queensland government in relation to the provision of our financial support, Senator Sheldon, as at the 28th of March, so only yesterday, $1.3 billion Order. has been paid to over 1.4 million Australians. And that is through the Australian Government Disaster Recovery Payment and the, uh, the Special Supplement and the Disaster Recovery Allowance. Mr President, there has been $291 million of 100 per cent, Senator Sheldon, Commonwealth funded, 100 per cent Commonwealth funded, direct support for those affected by the floods in New South Wales and Queensland. And you would be aware that this is in addition to targeted support announced for each state. Mr President, I could go on, but Senator Sheldon, this government is working with Order. New South Wales and Queensland to ensure Minister, that we Minister, respond appropriately. Your time has expired. Senator Sheldon, a supplementary question. When Lismore flooded a month ago, residents had to use their own speedboats and crowdfund private helicopters to rescue each other and were left to clean up on their own. As a Lismore community worker said in the aftermath, where is the government? Why does Scott Morrison always abandon Australians when they need him? Minister. Well, Senator Sheldon, again, I completely reject the premise Senator of that Watt. question. And I have just outlined Senator for Keneally. you, Senator Sheldon, the significant financial support that the government is providing to those Order. that have been affected by what is, Mr President, the devastation caused by the floods 
and that type of flooding has not been seen since 2011. But, Mr President, the Australian government has taken significant action, as we often hear Senator McKenzie outline in this chamber. And in particular, Senator Sheldon, the following actions have been taken. This is in addition to the $2.5 billion dollars that we are providing in financial support in response to the devastating flood. The Comms D plan was activated, Senator Sheldon, as you know, on the 25th of February. We activated the National Emergency Declaration on the 11th of March 2022. Minister, Minister your time has expired. Senator Sheldon, a second supplementary question. Well, the Prime Minister fled Hawaii, fled to Hawaii during Black Summer. He didn't order vaccines. He didn't order rats. He didn't show up for floods last month. Why does Scott Morrison always leave Australians to fend for themselves when people most need help? Minister, order, 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 Senator Watt. Minister. Well, again, Mr. President, this is what you get from Labor. Nothing more and nothing less than actually politicising events in which the government, this government is working on the ground with the New South Wales government and the Queensland government. Order. This government will stand by Australians every step of the way. And Senator Sheldon, if I took you through on a portfolio by portfolio basis, I can assure you Order that this is a government that does back Australians every single step of the way. This is a government that believes in the resilience of the Australian people. Order. This is a government that, faced with Order. a global pandemic, Senator has Keneally. ensured that we took those decisions that would protect both Australia and Senator Australians, Keneally. whether it was JobKeeper, JobSeeker or the health response. And when when it comes to the devastating Senator floods, McAllister. we are again working with the affected people on the ground to ensure that Senator they Wong. get the support Minister. that they require. Order. Senator Mirabella. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cash. Senator, how does the Liberal and National Government's plan for our economic recovery ensure job security for all Australians, not only now but into the future? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. And I thank Senator Mirabella for the question. And I do understand, Senator Mirabella, that it is your first question in this place. And how fitting, Senator Mirabella, that you ask a question in which the Australian people are actively interested, and that is, of course, Australia's economic recovery and how the policies of the Morrison government have, in particular, got more people back into work. Mr President, we know that on this side of the chamber, governments themselves do not create jobs. That is for the businesses out there, the employers out there. Governments put in place policies under which businesses are able to prosper, to grow and create more jobs for Australians. And colleagues, you will recall that in 2020, Labor's Jim Chalmers said this, the single biggest test of the government management of the pandemic is what happens to unemployment and jobs. Well, Mr President, on Jim Chalmers' own analysis, this is a government, Senator Mirabella, that has delivered for the Australian people. Senator and what the budget Senator tonight Kinley. will show, what the budget tonight will show is that the unemployment rate will drop colleagues to three and three quarter per cent later this year. And if you compare Senator that, Wall. colleagues, to what the unemployment was in September 13, the unemployment rate September 2013, colleagues, 5.7 per cent under Labor, and as former Senator Cormann used to always say, and rising, because that's their track record and rising. Senator Currently Keneally. under the coalition government, under the Morrison government, it is 4 per cent. And what you will see in the budget tonight is three and three quarter per cent later this year. Mr President, jobs are important to the Australian people. Work is important to the Australian people. And tonight you will see the lowest rate in half a century. This is a government that believes in policies Minister. to ensure businesses are able to Minister. employ more Australians. Senator Mirabella, a supplementary question. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Um, 
Senator Cash, how is the government's economic plan helping Australian families have the opportunity to achieve the Australian dream of owning their own home? Minister. Well, Mr President, again, the government we understand that home ownership is so important to the Australian people. And what Order. we are doing is we are making home ownership a reality for thousands more Australians. Mr President, as part of our government's plan for a stronger uh, future, we are supporting even more, even more aspiring homeowners to get into the market. And the way we're going to do that, and we'll have more to say about that tonight, is to build on the remarkable success of our government's home guarantee scheme. What we will now do is we will more than double, more than double the program to 50,000 places a year. This means that with this program, because it does get people into their home, we'll continue to help more single parents buy a home with a deposit as low as 2% and help more first home buyers with a deposit as low as 5%. That great Australian Minister. dream of home ownership tonight, Minister. you'll hear more about it. Senator Mirabella, a Thank second you, Mr. supplementary President. question. Uh, Senator, looking to the future, what are the risks to Australia's economic recovery as we continue to live with COVID-19 and the rising security challenges that face our region? Minister. Well, Mr President, as Senator Watt was screaming out across the chamber. What are the risks to the Australian people? Well, Senator, what, what I would actually say is an Albanese government. Because you see, Mr President, what does an Albanese government stand for? Well, over the last 30 years, Labor has delivered higher unemployment, higher interest rates, higher electricity prices, and, and colleagues, let us not forget, they have not delivered Order. a single balanced budget. Contrast that with Prime Minister Morrison. Prime Minister Morrison, who is ensuring that this government puts in place policies that enables businesses to prosper, grow, create more jobs for Australians. This government that now has more Australians in work than we did prior to COVID-19. This government that understands that Australians deserve Order. more of what Senator they earn, Kenley. and that's why we believe in lowering Minister, taxes. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is for the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Minister, you and I both know Russia is going after civilians and children in Ukraine. 300 people died in Maripol when a Russian plane bombed the drama theatre where they were taking shelter. Russia is attacking schools, hospitals and evacuation routes. Little kids are dying at a phenomenal rate. It is brutal and it is shocking. You've previously said that the international targeting of civilians is a war crime. Is Vladimir Putin a war criminal? Uh, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank uh, Senator Lambie for her question. And the uh, issues that she raises are deeply serious issues uh, in terms of the actions that are being taken by Russia in Ukraine. There are identified a number of acts, and Senator Lambie has uh, referred to those, uh, and the catastrophic humanitarian toll uh, is growing uh, as we know. There has been a reference to the International Criminal Court, which Australia supported, uh, and that International Court will make its assessment. There has also been a decision by the International Court of Justice, which enables investigations of these matters to begin now. Uh, and uh, my understanding is uh, that work will be underway as a result of that International Court of Justice question. But to be clear, as Senator Lambie indeed has been. The bombing of a school where it is known that hundreds of civilians are sheltering. The forced deportation of Ukraine residents, and particularly from Mariupol, to Russia. An airstrike on a theatre where it is known that civilians are sheltering. The bombing of a maternity hospital in Mariupol. The damaging of over 460 schools, over 40 health facilities in Ukraine indicates that these are matters of criminal behaviour in wartime. 
That is the reference which will be considered, Mr President. That is the reference Australia supported and supports, and I will continue to do that uh, on behalf of all members of this Senate. Here. Here. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Uh, Minister, Article 8 of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court states that it is a war crime to, and I quote, intentionally direct attacks against the civilian population as such or against individual civilians not taking direct part in hostilities. Putin's men are killing kids. I don't doubt they're doing it on his orders, and I don't doubt you do either. So I'm asking you. Basically, are you going to have the courage to come out and call him for what he is? Putin is a war criminal. When is Australia's foreign minister going to call him for what he is? He is a war criminal. Call it. Minister. Order. Minister. Thank you, Mr President. Senator Lambie, with the greatest of respect, I believe I responded to the questions that you raised in my first answer. Senator Lambie, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. President Biden says that Putin is a butcher who is bent on violence. He can't see how Putin can possibly remain in power after everything he's done. Do you at least back President Biden's statements? Minister. Thank you, Mr President. The Australian government is working as closely as possible with a range of international partners, and that most certainly includes the United States, the United Kingdom, members of the European Union, non-EU uh, non countries in Europe, uh, as well as our counterparts in Japan, in Korea, in New Zealand, in Singapore and others in the region. The Australian government has taken the strongest possible approach to our sanctions listings, Mr. President, including listing over 500 uh, individuals and entities. Uh, that includes, uh, of course, President Putin himself and President Putin's most senior advisers, the members of the Duma, who I regard and, the, and Australia regards as the political facilitators of this, uh, of this uh, egregious invasion. Senior members of the Belarusian uh, system oh, as well, sorry, including sorry, President Minister, Lukashenko and Minister, his immediate family. I'm sorry, Senator Lambie, on a point of order. Yeah, point of order is um, I just simply want to know is President Biden says that Putin is a butcher. Does she agree? Uh, Senator Lambie, you have reminded the Minister of your question. However, the Minister was being directly relevant. Minister, you have the call for 11 seconds. Thank you, Mr President, and let me conclude by saying that the strongest possible costs need to be imposed upon Russia. Australia is, uh, the, is a very strong participant in the sanctions process, having uh, Minister. Im imposed Minister. the sanctions I outlined earlier and others. Minister. Se Senator Lambie. Senator, Senator Lambie. Senator Sazelka. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience, Senator Mackenzie. In her train wreck interview with the Today Show, the minister was asked five times what the threshold was for declaring a national emergency after the floods. Five times she was unable to answer. Can the minister now explain the threshold for declaring a national emergency? Minister for Emergency Services, Senator Mackenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, uh, as Senator Watt rightly um, highlights, on the 11th of March, the Governor General enacted the National Emergency New South Wales Floods 2022 Declaration. The Prime Minister formally recommended a national emergency declaration following advice from the Director General of Emergency Management Australia, Joe Buffoni, who has also briefed uh, Senator Watt. Uh, in my own personal efforts to make sure that uh, we're as bipartisan as possible in dealing with this crisis on the 10th of March. This advice was provided in consultation with a range of Commonwealth agencies based on the best possible information uh, available at that point in time. The Prime Minister must be satisfied that the scale and impact of the floods meet the legal threshold to declare a national emergency. The making of a national Order. emergency declaration enlivens a range of powers to make it easier for affected communities to access Commonwealth assistance, including empowering ministers to suspend, vary or substitute red tape requirements, for example, to make it uh, easy for affected individuals with supplying identification, for instance, when they may have to um, apply for certain um, 
funding, disaster relief funding, allows the Prime Minister to access information from Commonwealth entities Minister. on stockpiles. Minister, resume your seat. Senator Watt on a point of order. Uh, thanks, Mr President. On relevance, uh, the minister referred to a threshold in her answer, but my question was what the threshold was. So could we get an answer on that, please? You've reminded the minister of the question. I am listening, um, but so far I believe the minister has been relevant to the question. But I will also point out, seeing as those opposite are interjecting in my ruling, that the question began with a highly political preamble. A narrowly framed question cannot start with a highly political preamble. Senator order. Senator McKenzie, order. Senator Watt, you are wasting the Senate's time now. Senator McKenzie, you have the call for yes, 38 seconds. Yes, thank you very much. Well, the Prime Minister has to be satisfied, as I said, that the scale and impact of the floods meet that threshold to declare it. Now, with this particular event, with this particular Order. event, there was not one single uh, event within the natural disaster as it occurred. Rather, it was the cumulative effect of the weather pattern as it rolled from Gympie right down the east coast, dumping, as the Bureau of Meteorology has said, a one in 500 catastrophe uh, year event catastrophe Order. on Lismore itself. And based on the cumulative impact of that event over time, Minister, the Prime Minister. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Uh, it's probably best that just that I re ask. Does the minister know what the threshold is that her department uses when advising to declare a national emergency? What is the threshold? Minister. As I said, the Prime Minister himself must be satisfied that the event actually meets the threshold. And he, ra he, he, he uh, bases that on a range of data and Order. advice. And as I outlined, Minister, on a point of order, on a on a point of order, relevance. What is the threshold? What what is the threshold? Set up. Order, Senator McKenzie, on the point of order. Sorry, I didn't think we were able to restate questions in points of order, so I was wondering whether that was the second supplementary, the first supplementary, or indeed just restating Senator the first McKenzie, question. Senator McKenzie, that is a debating point. Senator Wong, do you want the call? Yes, Senator please. Wong, on Thank the point you. of order. On the point of order, uh, which is a point of order around direct relevance. Um, the first supplementary, there was no political preamble. It was a very clear question to this minister. Uh, about the what is the threshold, uh, I would ask you to remind this minister of the question. I was listening to the minister's answer and I believe she was being relevant, so I am not going to remind her of the question. You have reminded her of the question, Senator Wong. I'm, I, I do not believe there was anything in the minister's answer so far that was not relevant to the question. Order. Minister, you have the call for 44 seconds. Yes, thank Minister. you, Mr President. Thank you. Well, the Australian Disaster Preparedness Framework defines a severe and catastrophic disaster as an event that is beyond current arrangements, thinking, experience and imagination, has overwhelmed our technical, non-technical and social systems and resources, has dis degraded Order. and disabled governance structures and strategic and operational decision-making functions. So in developing the advice to consider a declaration, the agencies have provided information on the following criteria. Okay, listen up. Historical analysis Order. and recurrence. The concurrence Senator and compounding Wong. effects and scale of the events, as I outlined in my first answer, demographics, Minister. weather impacts. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Watt, second supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. When asked why it took the Prime Minister so long to declare a national emergency following the recent floods, this minister replied that the Prime Minister must consult with state and territory premiers. 
But the relevant legislation clearly states the Prime Minister does not need to consult premiers if, and I quote, it is not practicable to do so. Why did the minister mislead flood victims when trying to explain the Prime Minister's delay in declaring a national emergency? Minister. Um, given um, Senator Watt's issue around the threshold, I can answer both the finish the threshold because there's quite a lot of thresholds. The weather impacts, the economic impacts, the flood extent, as I said, going down the east coast, vulnerability of disadvantaged populations, information, essential services and Minister. impact duration. Minister. Now, Mr President, Minister. going to Minister. Senator Watt's substantive... On the point of order. Point of order, Mr President, I asked, I, I asked two questions asking for the threshold. And now I've asked a different question, and I'm getting an answer to that question. I, the, Senator Watt. So, Senator Watt. Do I need I, to restate this question? I don't believe you do. I think the minister is very well aware of the question. Minister, uh, I, I heard the minister getting to the question. Minister, you have the call. 46 Thank you. seconds remaining. I am uh, seeking to be helpful. The fact. The fact of the matter is that the, it wasn't, uh, una the Prime Minister was not unable to consult with both uh, Premier Perrottet and Premier Palaszczuk because he was actually able Order. to consult with both of them. He doesn't need them both to agree to declare a national uh, emergency, but he does need to have the conversation and then he can choose to declare it or not, Order. unilaterally or not. So Order. the Prime Minister... Order. Contacted both uh, Premier Palaszczuk, Premier Palaszczuk and Premier Perrottet, um to actually consult them around the first time we've ever actually uh, Minister, used this particular Minister, emergency your, power. Minister, please resume your feet. Senator Cash. I ask that further questions be now placed on notice. And Senator Faruqi. Mr President, pursuant to Standing Order 1643, I ask the Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture in Northern Australia, Senator McKenzie, for an explanation as to why an order for the production of documents agreed to on 9 February 2022 concerning animal welfare incident reports has not been complied with. Senator McKenzie. Uh, Thank you, Senator Faruqi. I, in the bedlam, <laughs> could I have a few moments to respond to you appropriately? Because I am prepared to do that. Uh, Senator Faruqi, you, that is a response, so you can seek the call if you wish. Um, I, uh, Madam President, are we going to give Senator McKenzie a few moments? Or? Well, um, she has responded, so really okay, it's great. up to you. So, uh, Madam Deputy President, I move that the Senate take note of the Minister's failure to provide an answer or an explanation. Earlier this year, I moved an order for the production of documents regarding animal welfare incident reports held by the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment. That motion was agreed to unanimously by this chamber on the 9th of February. And the agreed motion allowed more than one week for the collection of the relevant documents, setting a deadline of 17th February. On that date, 17th February, Minister McKenzie wrote to the President stating that the Agriculture Minister had advised that due to the large number of documents being sought, he was unable to comply with the time frame. Critically, Oh, beg your pardon. Sorry, Senator McKenzie. Point of order. My apologies to the Senate and to Senator Faruqi. Um, consistent Senator with, McKenzie. I would seek leave to respond to Senator Faruqi's um, request earlier. Is leave granted? I don't think leave has been granted. Thank okay. you, Senator Faruqi. Continue your point. And then, Senator McKenzie, obviously you can respond then. Hmm. Um, so, as I was saying, on that date, 17 February, Minister McKenzie wrote to the President stating that the Agriculture Minister had advised that due to the large number of documents being sought, he was unable to comply with the time frame. Critically, the letter also says the Minister intends to respond to the order at the earliest possible opportunity. Well, it's now 29th March. 
Almost six weeks have passed since this letter was provided, so where on earth are these documents? I mean, this is a really frustrating situation where the government has promised the chamber certain materials, promised them at the earliest possible opportunity, and we are left hanging until this very last sitting week to try and get even an explanation for why they have not been tabled. The government, we know that this, this government will avoid transparency and accountability at every turn. It is quite and absolutely critical that these documents are tabled and this vital information about animal welfare is presented to the chamber. My motion in February followed an investigation published in the Age newspaper into horrific animal cruelty in export abattoirs. Documents obtained by Richard Baker of The Age related to incident reports covering just two months in 2019. The Age reported that according to these reports, some cattle and sheep arriving at Victorian export abattoirs were unable to bear their own weight. And a small number were so debilitated that they died during transportation or had to be put down on arrival. This is simply like disgusting, cruel stuff. And there must be a light shone on the extent to which these sorts of in incidents are taking place in Australian abattoirs. And that's why I moved this order. And I was very pleased to have it receive unanimous support of the Senate. When I asked about welfare in our export abattoirs during Senate estimates on 15th February, following this order being made the week before, the first Assistant Secretary of the Export and Veterinary Services Division, Ms. Nicola Hinder, stated, I'm happy to be able to provide you with details for the number of animal welfare incident reports that were lodged in 2020 and 2021 and talk about those in the construct of what they are on a proportionate basis. So these details came through just a few days ago. The department reports that across export establishments with an on-plant vet, there was an average of 316 incident reports raised annually across 2020 and 2021. So presumably over 600 reports. So where are these reports? The government clearly has them to hand the department has reviewed them. So either the government wants to release the details of these reports, wants to show its commitment to transparency and accountability, or it doesn't. What, what is it about these documents that you're trying to hide? Could it be that there are incidents detailed in these documents that reveal more horrifying incidents of animal cruelty in our abattoirs? It seems likely, but we won't actually know until they are tabled. And sadly, this is part and parcel of this government's hostility to any form of transparency in animal welfare. No matter what animal it is, what industry it is, um, and we know what's happening in live export ships. We know that in 2019, this parliament passed draconian ag-gag anti-protest laws that targeted activists who have bravely sought to uncover evidence of vicious animal cruelty at agriculture facilities and on farms. And those laws were designed to protect big agribusinesses from scrutiny and transparency. They were an absolute shame. And more recently, we have seen the removal of independent observers from the expo live export ships. There hasn't been an observer on a ship since June 2020. And the government blames COVID, but we know that animal welfare is never a priority for them. In fact, their mates in the live export industry have been pushing for the program to be rolled back. We know, we know, Minister, that you lot really don't care about animals. You don't see them as sentient beings, just as commodities to be made a profit of. And that's why, that's why the Greens have been pushing for some time now for an independent office of animal welfare to take it out of agriculture, where there is a massive conflict of interest, where that department supposedly have a remit of protecting animals and looking after their welfare, but then also making mega bucks of them. And we know what wins out every time, making profit at the expense of animals wins out every single time. And now we have this big inexplicable, shameful delay in the tabling of these critical documents relating to animal welfare in abattoirs. So I do call on the government to urgently provide the documents for the sake of transparency, for the sake of respecting the order of the Senate, and above all, 
for the sake of the poor animals who have suffered and whose suffering must not be kept a secret. Thank you, Senator Fruki. Minister. Uh, thank you. And, and my, again, I apologise to Senator Faruqi and uh, to the Senate. Uh, my advice is that, consistent with the response that was tabled on 17 February uh, 2022, documents within the scope of the order are still being assessed by the Minister for Agriculture and Northern Australia. Thank you, Minister. If there are no further speakers, I'll put the motion. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We'll now move to taking note of answers. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Cash and Mackenzie to the questions asked by Senators Sheldon, McAllister and myself. Uh, can I begin by acknowledging that the people of northern New South Wales and South East Queensland again today face a very dire flooding situation? I think all of us uh, just are shaking our heads at the fact that, particularly in northern New South Wales, the very same communities that were badly affected by floods only a month ago are now facing evacuation orders again uh, because of uh, the flooding that is occurring there right now. Uh, we have seen over the last few weeks some extremely unusual weather systems and highly unusual levels of rain, and it is tragic. Uh, that people are being put through this situation yet again when they are still in the process of cleaning up from the last floods, let alone beginning the job of rebuilding. So I'm sure I speak for everyone here today when I pass on our very best wishes and solidarity with uh, the people, particularly of northern New South Wales, but also South East Queensland, as these floods progress. And we do hope uh, that people remain safe and listen to all of the warnings that are issued by authorities. Today, in question time, we asked a series of questions uh, to Ministers Cash and Mackenzie about the, the way the government handled last month's floods. Uh, and looking back on it, it's very sad that throughout those floods and in the weeks afterwards, we saw all the worst qualities of the Morrison government and this Prime Minister on display. People being abandoned in their hour of need by their federal government a government and a Prime Minister that was completely missing in action as the floodwaters rose, as they receded and as the clean-up began. And true to form, the politicisation of grant payments by a government during a natural disaster. I mean, we've become used to this government rorting every possible funding program it can get its hands on, whether it be car parks or sports rorts. Uh, every other kind of rot under the sun, but to see a government politicise uh, the allocation of grant funding uh, based on colour-coded spreadsheets uh, in the natural disaster is a new low even for this government. Now, I know we've heard members of the government object to Labor describing this as politicisation, and I can hear Senator Macdonald doing it now. Well, if Senator Macdonald and her colleagues don't like listening to Labor politicians describe this government's behaviour as politicisation. Perhaps they'd care to listen to some of the people from their own side of politics, such as New South Wales Upper House member Catherine Cusack, who announced that after a distinguished career in the New South Wales Parliament, she was going to resign because of what she called, and I quote, the Prime Minister's unethical approach to distributing flood funding. And what she was referring to was the fact that the National Party held electorate of Page, which did suffer extremely bad flood damage, uh, that electorate and the communities in it were receiving higher levels of disaster assistance than those communities who were equally affected uh, a little bit further up the road uh, in the elect Labor held electorate of Richmond. A New South Wales Liberal MP describing the Prime Minister's approach as unethical. And that was backed in by the National Party state member for the seat of Tweed, Mr Jeff Provost, uh, who labelled the Prime Minister's behaviour as disgusting and deplorable. And he went on to say that he would struggle to vote for the Prime Minister. So park to one side whatever anyone from Labor might be saying about the way this government has handled these floods. Let's just listen to some of the local members who are actually from the coalition. But more importantly, let's listen to people who are on the ground. 
And I can tell you, having been in Lismore through the floods, and I know Senator Macdonald didn't think I should be there, uh, having been in Queensland floods for over a week, uh, I can tell you that people in Lismore did feel abandoned because the question that I was asked most often by people who were suffering from the floods in Lismore was simple. It was, where is the government? Because during the floods, in the immediate aftermath of the floods and in the clean-up from the floods, there has barely been a member of this government present or barely an official of this government present lending a hand to people who had suffered terrible damage, who had lost, lost loved ones. They were exhausted and yet they were left there on their own to clean up by this government. And of course, we've seen this before. It is a disgrace, Senator McCarthy. We've seen this before because this is a Prime Minister who went missing in action after the bushfires, who didn't bother ordering vaccines, who didn't bother ordering rapid antigen tests, and of course is only discovering cost of Thank living as a problem Senator in the run up Your to an time election. Has expired. Senator McDonald. Thank you very much. Uh, I will be, Senator Watt will be amazed to hear me be in, uh, in agreement with him of the terrible catastrophe uh, that has been the flooding in southern Queensland and northern New South Wales. Uh, you'll find no argument from uh, anybody in this place that what has happened, uh, particularly in Lismore, that has been described as like a tsunami had been through there, a uh, township where there is still no power and the, and the businesses are boarded up uh, because they will not be able to be repaired uh, for months. Uh, you know, who knows how long that process will take as business owners decide uh, what, what uh, situation they're in and what position they will take. Uh, where there are still thousands of people displaced from their homes. Uh, and yes, as the rain falls now, uh, what a worrying situa situation that is for them. However, to say that the government has been absent uh, to try and link uh, this to uh, other political agendas is devastating, on top of the natural disaster, to then have their issues politicised in this way is incredibly unfortunate. Uh, I have seen uh, so many of our uh, ministers and, uh, and other government members um, show their support, both physically and in any way that they can. Uh, I applaud Senator Watt's decision to go to Lismore uh, because you know, that is the sort of help that Australians give to each other and that the community, as the floodwaters rose and there was no way for government officials, for uh, the NBN, for um, anybody else to enter that region because the roads were cut, because the, the weather was so heavy that even uh, well, it was Life Flight, Life Flight from Queensland, who had the only suitable helicopter with the suitable infrared uh, detection to be able to detect people in roof spaces and to be able to pluck people off roofs. Uh, this is the sort of equipment that was required in that that time. And you know, my my th sincere thanks to the members of Life Flight who had to oversee that particular uh, mission. Um, so members of the community, people who had jet skis and kayaks and other boats, they turned to help their neighbours as Australians do in the immediate aftermath or during a disaster, during a disaster. And I think we should be acknowledging uh, that community help and then what happened in the days afterwards. Uh, as uh, I know, government services who spent days in, in motels just trying to be able to get physical access into some of these regions. Uh, the army who was on the ground, uh, who didn't have the benefit of some of the organisation they might have had from, say, the Brisbane City Council, who was able to mobilise hundreds of, of workers to get out and take photos and document the places where the army needed to be. Remember that the Lismore town, the council workers had lost their homes. There, there was not a, a connection of of uh, resources and support, like in Brisbane, where a portion of the town had been flooded, all of Lismore had been flooded. And to say that the government's response uh, does, was not adequate does not absolutely understand that. Uh, the Prime Minister in the weeks following had COVID. Uh, the opposition leader had gone to Western Australia, but the community kept going and government services poured in. 
uh, and as part of that flood response and recovery, there has been uh, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in, in uh, support, financial support, uh, in the army, uh, nearly a billion dollars in services that have gone into that region uh, in cleanups and pickups. But this is a one in 500 year disaster. And the local member, Kevin Hogan, the member for Page, has lived through the trauma of his family, his friends, as well as the people who live in his community being without a home, without a business, and yet others on the other side seek to make this a political issue rather than do what Australians do best, which is pull together, support those people, uh, drive additional uh, resources as they are identified. Uh, I, 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 I think that we should be thinking more about the people who are in such desperate stances and how we can assist rather than how we seek to criticise. Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Deputy President. The people of northern New South Wales and south east Queensland have been devastated by extreme flooding and rainfall over recent months. And this disaster is continuing. Uh, as we meet here today, people in Korokai, Lismore, Tumbulgum, Billy Nudgel, Mullumbimby, Kyogle, Mwoolumba, Condong, all subject to evacuation orders and warnings. These floods have caused the destruction of property and tragically the loss of life. Tens of thousands of people have been forced to flee their homes. And the damage caused to these communities is actually difficult to adequately describe. These communities cannot be left on their own. I do know these communities well. I was born in Moolumba in the hospital and I was born there in a flood. And yes, flooding is a fact of life for people in the Northern Rivers. There's something in the name that gives you a clue that there might be a bit of water about. But these natural disasters are becoming more severe and we should be better prepared for them. This is not what the Morrison government has delivered. The floods that struck the region last month had a very personal impact. Uh, at first, I was stranded there with my mum and dad in the midst of that emergency, although fortunately, I really should say, in a safe location. Sadly, so many others in my communities were not so lucky. A week later, I returned to assist with the clean-up and met with locals. Many people have commented on this, but it was evident in Lismore uh, that the community spirit was overwhelming. Volunteers had set up community centres. They were incredibly well organised. Young people were fronting up with brooms and gloves and mops. People were preparing food. Emergency services and frontline workers were working around the clock. And I can't thank all those people enough for everything that they were doing then and everything that they continue to do. But on that visit, there were plenty of tears. Uh, the damage is enormous. I think it's difficult to imagine what it means to lose your home and to lose your place of work. There is nowhere to go. This community is resilient, it is caring, but it is a community that has been through a lot. People have lost everything and they should not have to beg for support. And that support should not depend on whether they are in a National Party seat or a Labor Party seat. Locals are hurting. Our candidate in Page is a man called Patrick Deegan. And he said this, I've seen the pain and desperation in people's eyes. I've heard the stories of loss, shock and helplessness. The people of the Northern Rivers need to know that the government has their back, that there is a plan, that they are not in their own. Now I hear people in this chamber say we shouldn't be discussing it in these terms, that it's not proper to point out where government has let people down. But when an announcement is made for support for some communities in a National Party electorate, but not for other communities, then we actually have a problem with the way that support is being administered. And the truth is that on the ground, people are saying that they feel abandoned. Flood victims across Queensland and New South Wales say this. 
They feel that they've been left to fend for themselves in the immediate response to the flood and now in the recovery as well. And was made worse by the fact that when the Prime Minister finally travelled to Lismore, it was for a photo opportunity and not to meet with the flood victims who wanted to know why his government had abandoned them at a time of desperate need. My friend Janelle Safin, the local member, lost her home. She was forced to swim for her life through Lismore's floods and she has continued to work tirelessly for her community. She's continued to show up every single day. And this is Janelle Safin. This is her putting her community first. And there are so many more like Janelle who've been doing what they can to support their communities. And this is what leadership looked like. It means taking responsibility when things are tough. And these communities are in desperate need of government support and the Prime Minister could learn a lot from representatives like Janelle. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Henderson. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I, I would like to start my contribution by expressing my deep concern and my sympathy to um, all those communities in northern New South Wales and South East Queensland who have suffered and who are continuing to suffer from the disastrous floods. Lives have been lost and I express my sincere condolences to the families and friends of those who have tragically died. I also put out my hand of support to Senator McAllister and her family, um, who are among many families from the Northern Rivers who are directly impacted and are suffering from these floods. I have at the moment a very good friend who's living with me because she was caught in the floods. She didn't lose her house, but everything else is basically being wiped out. She lived in a very small community called Crabs Creek, northwest of Byron Bay. And when she sent me the video of the way that Crabs Creek had erupted into a horrendous flood, it was absolutely frightening. So. While I am a senator for Victoria and I haven't uh, yet been up to the northern rivers and, and south east Queensland, uh, I have seen and experienced firsthand the trauma that this has and is continuing to cause. I do want to reflect on Senator McAllister's words when she said it's some people will say it's not proper for us to make these political points in relation to flood disaster relief. And I will simply say, yes, Senator McAllister, it is not proper. Because first of all, in the distribution of some $1.33 billion, which Services Australia has paid out in Australian government disaster recovery payments and disaster recovery allowance, allowance to over 1.4 million people, in urgent need in Queensland and New South Wales, I want to put on the record very strongly, there is no differentiation as to where someone lives, whether they live in a National Party seat or whether they live in a Labor Party seat. Um, every single person who has suffered and meets the criteria is entitled to that payment. And I really re reflect on the experience that I had when I was supporting my local constituents in Wye River and Separation Creek after those communities were wiped out by a bushfire in 2015. And despite the terrible trauma that they suffered, 116 homes were lost, miraculously no one died. And while I have been a, a fairly <laughs> continuing critic of the Victorian government led by Premier Daniel Andrews, I did not see the politicisation of that natural disaster that I see now from those opposite. And I do say to Labor, it is so regrettable that you have stooped to such a low to so politicise a natural disaster. And I would please say, yes, there are people who are hurting. Yes, there are people who are angry. But for goodness sake, let us work together to support Australians in their hour of need. And for Senator McAllister to, to be quoting the Labor candidate, which is clearly all about politics, at a time 
when all of us need to be focused on those residents who are living in these areas who are thinking, where am I going to live? How am I going to earn a living? Um, where is my next night's accommodation? Um, we understand how, how absolutely devastating this is. But Australians don't need to be confronted with this low-level politicisation of a natural disaster like we have never seen before. And I have lived through, as we all have, many natural disasters and seen firsthand, whether it's Ash Wednesday, Black Saturday, Black Summer, the Wye River uh, bushfires, and, and really I just say to Labor senators opposite and to the Labor Party, please, you can do better than this. And to characterise the Prime Minister's <laughs> visit as a photo opportunity is just so revoltingly offensive. He met with many families behind closed doors. And I really say to Labor, please, at this time, let us work together to support those who need our help and just keep the politics out of this. Thank you, Senator Thank you. Henderson. Uh, Senator Chisholm. Uh, thanks, Madam Deputy President. And uh, my thoughts are also with those people who are being impacted by floods at the moment, particularly those who are facing it for the second time in a short period. Um, through my work as a senator for Queensland, uh, I went and visited uh, Gympie a couple of weeks ago, um, which itself had suffered its second flood this year. Uh, and the flood that they suffered just recently was actually their worst flood since 1890 uh, in a town that unfortunately does flood regularly. So um, I uh, got a sense from my visit to Gympie, just the, those people who have gone through it a second time in such a short period and how traumatic that experience is. So I hope those communities are getting the support that they need. Uh, I did want to respond uh, around this claim of politicisation because I think this is important. Uh, and when you've got nothing else to say, uh, when your response is incompetent, all you have to rely on is claims of politicisation. And that's actually what they've come into this chamber and tried to defend it today. But it's because their lack of response. And the tragedy for the Australian people with this government is they actually are incapable of learning a lesson. Incapable of learning a lesson. And it wasn't us saying it. It was actually the National Party member for Tweed. It was actually a Liberal member of the upper house. So they're the politicians, not us. And Senator McAllister, Senator Watt, uh, the excellent member for Richmond, all they are doing is their job of voicing concerns of local residents. That's actually what they were doing. And if it wasn't for the work that they were doing, adding voice to those people who were impacted, the government response would have been more lacking than what it was. That's how disgraceful that their efforts have been. So uh, the Liberal Upper House member, uh, Cusack, called it unethical. Uh, the member for Tweed, Jeff Provost, said uh, the government have really messed this yep. up. This is like a remake of the bushfires some two years ago. So exactly the point that I am making was made by the National Party member for Tweed, who said that this government haven't learnt their lesson from more than two years ago when it comes to bushfires. And this is, unfortunately, Australians are having to put up with more of these natural disasters. We've seen it in Queensland. We've seen it in other parts of the country as well. And this is the problem with this government is that they actually are not learning any lessons. Uh, they are not actually getting better in their response. And then when they do respond, it's actually more political. Uh, so we've seen that now today, um, people in Gympie are getting $1,000 compared to people in Lismore getting $3,000 as part of the response. There are people living in tents in Gympie, same as they are in those other parts, months after this has happened, and the government are doing nothing for those people as well. Uh, so it is unfortunate that we've got, to make, uh, we've got to speak out on these people's behalf because the government don't listen, um, they're incompetent, they don't actually respond and fix these problems, and all too often, their response is political. Uh, they get out the spreadsheet, they decide uh, where they give additional support uh, because that's how this government operates, that's how they've always operated. And unfortunately, the only way things are going to improve is if this government are voted out. That's the only way we're actually going to see some change. And it's an example 
of why they don't deserve to be re-elected. Uh, because of their incompetent response to floods, uh, it flows on from two years after their incompetent response to bushfires as well. So it is uh, evident for the Australian people now that uh, when it comes to disasters, um, the Prime Minister doesn't hold a hose, um, he doesn't respond, and the government have learnt no lessons on how to respond to that in government. Uh, we also know that when it comes to the crisis of ordering vaccines, the government again were all too slow to act despite saying we would be at the front of the queue. And again, over summer and in recent months, uh, when the country so desperately needed rapid antigen testing, again the government was missing in action. So it is actually an incompetent government. There are so many ways that that is uh, highlighted, uh, and all they can do is try and claim politicisation of issues. That's because they can't actually defend themselves. Uh, they are incompetent, and the only way this will be improved, because they've shown over almost 10 years now they don't learn any lessons, is if we vote them out. That is the only option left to the Australian people. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Watt to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Wish Wilson. Rise to take note of the uh, non responses by Senator Hume to my questions today on the bleaching of the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, I've been here for nearly 10 years, uh, Deputy President. I've consistently asked questions about the changes we've seen in our oceans as the Greens Ocean portfolio holder. I've chaired multiple Senate inquiries in the Environment, Communications and Reference Committee into warming oceans, into the grant to the Great Barrier Reef Foundation. I've consistently asked questions and estimates, not just to changes we're seeing in the Barrier Reef, but off my coastline in Tasmania, indeed all around the country. Uh, and I wouldn't have believed 10 years ago if you'd sat me down and said, Senator, you're going to witness these changes. I wouldn't have believed you. Even as someone who cared deeply about the oceans and someone who followed climate change so closely. I've asked questions at Senate question time now for 10 years. I've been laughed at when I've raised the issues that our oceans are dying. I've been told I need to get a hanky by the head of government business when I've raised the very first results of the 2016 mass coral bleaching on the Great Barrier Reef. And I tell you, Deputy President, it is hard today not to be filled with rage and despair at the response that I got from this minister to the fourth mass coral bleaching on the greatest natural wonder of this planet in the last six years. This bleaching in a La Nina year. God help us if the reef is bleaching in a La Nina year. We know from the IPCC science that on a business as usual scenario, our current trajectory, we are witnessing the terminal decline of not just the Great Barrier Reef, but many of our ocean ecosystems. This is a fact. The IPCC says that even on a two-degree warming scenario, which is the current Paris Protocols, Kyoto Protocols, we are still going to see a 99 per cent decline in the coral cover on the Great Barrier Reef. That's on a 2 per cent scenario. We've already seen radical changes on a one degree of warming, one degree above pre-industrial levels. So imagine a doubling of that, and that's somehow a good result. All I want from this government is truth. No more denial. I would like to see them come out and say that climate change is the biggest threat to the Great Barrier Reef, and we know that climate change is warming our oceans and what is causing that is predominantly the burning of fossil fuels. Why aren't we talking about this in here all day, every day? Why isn't it on the news? Why has it barely been reported? 
Why are we so distracted with other things when our planet is changing before our eyes and we can act? But we will only act if people understand what's at stake. It's the only thing they will do to vote for change is if they know how serious this is. And it might beg a simple question. Why aren't we talking about this every day? Why isn't it in the news every night? Why do Labor and Liberal not talk about this issue? Well, the answer must be simple too. That is because they are complicit in the changes we are seeing on the Great Barrier Reef and in this ocean. We know we need to cut emissions by 2030 by 75 per cent to have any chance of even meeting 1.5 degree of warming. 50 per cent more heat stored in the ocean than we already have. And that's a 75 per cent emissions reduction by 2030. But what do we get? We get laughable targets from the two major parties that are worried about their own political fortunes and worried about annoying the hell out of their fossil fuel donors. It is not good enough. And I urge Australians to vote for the Barrier Reef, to vote for our oceans. Send the strongest possible message this federal election that whoever forms government needs to act. The strongest possible message you can send is to vote Green. Hey, Senator Wish Wilson, Senator Furavanti Wells, were you seeking? The yes, I was on call? notice no, of motion. No, sorry, sorry, we. I do need to put the question. Uh, the question is that we take note of the answers uh, from Senator Hume to questions from Senator Wish Wilson. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Uh, now we will. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day, Senator Furavanti?